So now move to move on to installing the base system. And first thing to do here is to run this mirror select command. Now we haven't got this command because we haven't booted from a Gen 2 um, bootable installation medium. So we can't run that at the moment, it's not a problem. Um, it will still work, I think it just uses the main um, repository which is a little bit unfortunate but it's something that we can add in later. So the next thing we want to do is create this directory for the repos, the Gen2 repository and any others we want to add in by hand. Then we can copy in a predefined config file into that directory and there's a listing of that file we've just copied. Now normally you wouldn't need to edit this but because I've got my own copy of the Gen2 repository um, it saves me having to sync up more than once every day which is um, something they don't like you doing because it puts a lot of load on the servers um, so if you can try and limit the number of times you sync up um, but uh, otherwise it should be okay if you do want to set up your own server um, I have got videos on my channel on how to do that and basically you have a server that downloads the updates once a day and then you configure your machines to communicate with that server rather than the main server um, the main Gen2 server so I'm just going to edit this file so that I am actually pointing at my one so you won't need to do this bit unless like I say you have got your own server and all I do is change this part here to the IP address of that server and save it oh, is it the keyboard again Looks like my eight button stopped working. All right. Let's see if that fixes it. Oh, oh I mean, oh, I didn't realise I'm in Vi. I thought it was in Nano again. Right. This is where it gets confusing. So let's try that again. Right, right, that's better. Okay, so that's edited. So that means that uh, we'll be able to connect to the Gen 2 repository. I'll be able to connect to my own repository, which is a copy of the Gen 2. Next thing it says to copy the DNS info. So let's do that. Now what I find is this doesn't copy um, domain information so if you've got your own domain which I run again on my own server you'll want to edit this file that we've just created um, etc resolve and you can see it's got the name servers in there I don't normally use the second one because the server takes care of that and all I do is add in domain um, and the name of the domain. That's all that's needed there. Right. is now mounting the files are oh, right okay so what this is now is we're going to 
um, mount file systems that are part of the Raspberry Pi file system and we're going to make them available to our new Gen 2 system ready for routing into that um, Gen 2 system. So as it says here, the make our slave operations are needed for system D support later on in installation. Now I don't think you need these if you're not using system D, but you might want to add them in anyway just to be sure. Um, I have installed this without those options. Um, but just to be sure, I'm actually going to add them in. But as I say, I have successfully built this without those options. So not sure what it does. Um, the reason why I'm adding them in is because there are some programs that are derived from System D that we will be installing or, or are used in System D. So it's just to be sure that those programs operate correctly. Then it says when using non Gen 2 installation media, this might not be sufficient. Some distributions make dev SHM symbolically into run SHM, which after the root becomes invalid. So if we run this command in here, it tests to see if this dev SHM exists, and if it doesn't, it creates it. And then we can mount the temporary FS at that location. And finally, we just change the permissions because it is a temporary directory. Now that's all done, we can enter the troop environment with this command here and get a nice bit of color, which I quite like. Debian based distributions don't tend to have color because of reasons that Debian think that your eye shouldn't be drawn to the prompt, but what you're actually should be looking at is what you're typing in or what the last response was so but I prefer color so I'm happy this with this because um, it draws your eye to the prompt and then you know at the prompt you either look up for the previous response or you look at the prompt to see what you're typing that's how I how my brain works anyway so add those commands so you can see what's happened is we've truted in we've run the profile so we've got the profile from Gen 2 in memory and then we've just altered the prompt string so that troops in front of it to remind us that we are actually in the troop environment and not in a, a real environment. And next thing we need to do is to mount the boot, partition that boot. Now this will fail because we haven't created the boot directory. Oh sorry, yes we have. the yes, beg pardon, that was created when we expanded the stage 3 files. So if we do df-h you can see we've now got STA1, which is our boot partition mounted at boot, and we've got our root partition mounted at S, um, which is STA3 mounted on root, and also we can do swap on to see the swap partition is activated. Um, now, the next bit we need to get the eBuild repository snapshot from the web. Um, it says it's recommended to run this for those who are behind restrictive firewalls. Um, readers who have no network or bandwidth restric restrictions can happily skip down to the next section. So I used to run this, but uh, for me it seemed to be a, a little bit more work to do. So I'll just skip that now because I haven't got these restrictions. So if you feel like you might be restricted in some way, either through bandwidth or firewalls, then just run that command. Otherwise, uh, we can run this emerge sync and that will sync all of the um, repo information onto the Raspberry Pi. And this will take a little while because it's obviously got to sync the whole lot. Um, don't know how the date of it, well, it might not even exist actually, it might have to download the whole lot. So I'll just wait um, a few minutes for this to happen. Normally when you sync from day to day or week to week, it, it maybe takes half a minute, a minute, so it's really quick, but this is this will take a little bit longer. Um, uh, so it might take five or 10 minutes to do this. So I'll come back when that's complete.
Right, so that's all synchronized now. Um, the next bit it mentions is about news items. You can see we've got an important message there saying there's six items to be read. Um, so it explains how the news module works as part of this custom program for Gen 2 called eSelect. There's other different modules. You'll see a few others as we go through. Um, the installation we will be using other parts of this e-select so if I um, get my keyboard working again select news and if you just put in e-select news on its own um, it will tell you how to use the command same way as if you do e-select on its own it will tell you what it's capable of um, just to, as I say, one of those modules and it tells you how to use it. So, the best one to start off with news is to list them. And as you can see, it, it mentions certain things there that you need to um, act upon. Now, straight out, um, I can tell you that the, unless you're using LDAP, which is probably unlikely for SSH, we can. Just read two um, four as well, and probably six um don't, I mean you can read them if you like if you can understand what they're talking about, but for the purposes of setting up a brand new gen two they're probably not really really required uh, sorry that should be news read so what I'll do is just read those or just display them all to the screen, just whiz past, and that's it um. So if I do list again, see which ones are remaining. So number one, we'll have to, well, um, the link was, I'm not sure if it's still around actually, but the it will remind me that we need to set the localization, which is what the L10N is. Um, it's a variable that used to be called linguas, it's now called L10N. Um, there is a specific section in the Gen 2 wiki about setting that. Um, so it's probably best to look that up. Accept license, I think that's to do with the licensing that's been changed with Gen 2. Um, again, you might want to read that yourself. In fact, I'm going to get rid of that because I'll only deal with that when or if and when install a package that needs a different license. By default, off the top of my head, all Gen 2 packages are installed have got a free license. And if there's anything that doesn't match that, you'll get a warning and it'll tell you about the license and what to read and um, what sort of license it is and so on. So I'll just read that to get rid of it. I've done it again. News read. And you can see some information there about it. Um, I'll actually also get rid of number five because that's about display manager and um, how that's going to be changing. Well, it's been around for a few weeks now so I would have thought it's changed by now and as I say, I'm not going to be uh, going as far as the graphical environment so that's going to be pretty meaningless in this situation so news read 5 to get rid of that um, so that just leaves the one item which I suppose I could deal with now actually um, basically what it is in, I haven't got via here we know, in etc portage make.conf we can add in um, a variable here called L10N and all you do is you add in some uh, codes which represent the languages that you want for any software that is language aware. So for in uh, British English, I add in EN because that's a kind of generic English and then ENGB for any specific things. So that might be, for example, dictionaries with a word processor. It will pick those up um, as opposed to say American, Australian or any other type of English. Um, so it's useful to have. As I say, there is a um, page about setting that variable 
um, on the wiki so you can search for that and find out what setting should be for your language. Next bit uh, is about profiles. So they've got some predefined profiles which set specific flags. Uh, there are something called use flags um, which uh, allow you to configure how Gen 2 works, how packages work and it's one of the big strengths of Gen 2. You can have for example, well if we go back to the word processor um, example you might decide you don't want to use a built-in dictionary and there might be a flag for that to disable it or might be one to enable it for example and uh, that's down to you to decide you don't have to um, either put up with what the package maintainers have, have delivered or maybe add in another package separately you just change this flag and um, when you compile it will bring that functionality in um, and you can find out about things like that by if you put in packages if I can spell Gen2 for example I did Libra Office and generally one of the top yeah the top one there you see it's App Office is the category it's in if you click on that it'll take you to the page about this particular package so it shows you all the versions available so you can see there's an AMD 64 version um, there's an ARM and ARM64 versions. The green means it's ready, well, it's prime time, it's fine to use. The yellow means it's um, in beta, or uh, rather it's in testing, sorry. Uh, as you can see, there's the pop up there, it says it's in testing, so you have to override that, and I'll show you that because we'll co come across some packages. How to do that? There's links here for dependencies and so on, information about it. And then further down, these are the use flags. So it tells you which ones are local use flags. So these are use flags that are particular just to this package. And then there are other use flags which are global. So they're with the system. And generally, these system ones, you do want to apply them to the whole system rather than just packages. But very occasionally, you either want to enable or disable certain flags that might be global flags, but you want to do it just per package. And again, I'll be showing you how to do that and it shows some other variables that are used as well. Um, you can also get a lot of this information with some um, command line programs but I'll show you them later on. Uh, it's not, not really to be shown now, it will get away from the actual installation. But these profiles you can see there's default profiles, in fact there's more than what's on display there. Um, probably because you can see this is profile 17.0 for the ARM64 but this remember we're following the AMD64 uh, handbook so it's probably why the 17.1 maybe the ARM64 hasn't been upgraded to that newer version but you can see there's various options there if you want um, a developer version or system D version or if you want a desktop with Plasma for KDE or GNOME for example etc um, or if you wanted to use I think that's a C library muzzle and so on. So I'm just going to stick to the default um, profile which will have fewer customizations. Uh, might mean there's a little bit more work to do to keep things going but um, it does mean you retain more control over it. Um, as it says there if you're using systemd to ensure that you use a profile that's got systemd in the title such as that one. Get the highlight there or that one. And if you're using OpenRC, which is what I'm using, to make sure you do not use a profile that's got System D in the title. And it says there about profile upgrades to be careful about it. And if you want to change it, to use the eselect command again, as it says there, to select one of these options. So if I wanted, for example, Plasma, Desktop Plasma, I'll do eselect 5 because that's the option number next to the Plasma option. So I was unsure whether there was, there was a no multi-lib or multi-lib. The reason is because there is no option for that. So I presume that this is not a multi-lib environment, that it is pure 64-bit. Um, I don't know for certain, but I'm presuming that. Um, especially from what I've seen when I've been experimenting with this, I've not seen um, anything where it said that it's one or the other, it's always seems to have been 64-bit 
um, stuff that we've been dealing with. So the next thing it says here to do is to update the world set. So the snapshot of the stage three was taken, I think it's up to a week ago. So it's going to be slightly out of date. Um, so by running this command in here, we'll update the current system. Uh, there's two other things to mention about this. The first thing is that the make.conf file has um, an option for, let's edit this, my keyboard's very slow, um, has an option for adding in the global variables. And if I edit this file, I'll show you that you can add that in. I normally add it in just down here somewhere. Uh, sorry, not there, there. And all you do is you type in use in capitals equals, and then you just add in certain flags. And I know for a fact that um, sometimes I've had point to point protocol come up, and I don't want that, don't need that. It's for mainly for dial up modems, maybe ISDN if that still exists. Um, and also IPv6, which I don't use either, so I'll take that one out as well. So I'll take that out by putting a minus sign in front and putting in the flag that I don't want and separating each one uh, with a space. And if there's anything I want to bring in, then you just put the use flag in without the minus sign. And there's various ways of getting the use flags. I'm sure the handbook will tell us when we come to it, but I'll tell you now, if you just type in Gen 2 use flag index into a browser. Then generally the first link is the link you'll want. And you can see there's a, quite a big web page that comes up, which is why it's taking a while to load up. And the first thing it loads up or displays are the global use flags. So these are the flags that you'll tend to want to put into the make.conf file, which is one I'm editing here. So if I look down to IPv6, you can see, where is it? Oh, in fact, it's not a global flag, but because I don't want it appearing anywhere, by putting it in here, it acts as if it's a global flag. So if there's any package that hasn't got, or sorry, or has got IPv6 as a local flag, the fact that I put it in here is automatically disabled um, globally for every, any package that does use it. I'm not sure about PPP, if that's one. No, that's not one either, actually. But um, again, I, I globally do not want any of the or either of these options. So that's why I've added them in make.conf. It's not a hard and fast thing to only have global flags in make.conf. You use it as you see fit. Like I said before, you could put a global flag in a local flag config file and it will, will behave as a local flag. The reason there's a discrepancy or difference, rather, differentiation between global and local is that unless it says otherwise, a global flag will behave the same for whatever package um, uses the global flag. Sometimes, I think for the doc, is it doc? Um, oh, no, they recommend to add the doc in uh, per package rather than globally. That's probably because it's be a lot more compilation if you did add it globally. You might only want documentation for certain packages. Um, yeah, I can't find one now, but there, there is um, uh, warnings about some of these global flags where it says, like, be careful because it, or it might be on the local flags actually. Um, the flag actually has different meanings. So although it's the same word, it has different meanings depending on what package it's um, associated with. So you do have to be careful. But with the global flags, you, you are safe. Um, like I say, unless it says otherwise, you'll know that, for example, if you add in Unicode, that Unicode support will be added to whatever package uses it for any package within Gen 2. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's any others. I can add here before I actually um, do an update and I can't really see anything that stands out immediately. So the thing to bear in mind is as soon as you alter the global flag, if you've got any packages installed that use that flag, then it's another rebuild. It's more compilation. It's more time. 
So you want to try and little, be a little bit smart if you can make any changes um, up front. It will, or it could potentially save you uh, compilation time. So that's why I've added in these two options that I don't want installed at any time. And it will probably trigger rebuilds of certain packages which are already part of the default Gen 2 system. Um, and they, I'm pretty sure the IPv6 one does. It will just update those packages to remove that functionality because that's something I definitely don't want. Um, so yeah, it's got here a command to update what they call the world set. I actually use a modified version of that, which I find I have fewer problems with. It adds a few more options. Um, it can make the update or the um, the kind of the the way it, when it runs when the merge command runs to find out what changes need to be implemented. It can make that run a little bit slower. But I found it's more thorough, um, and I have met much much for fewer problems by running these extra options. So um, if I save this, I'll show you what options I use. Right, my disk has gone to sleep because I've been nattering away too much. So I'll just wait for that to come back to life. Okay, that's saved. So the emergent option I use, I'll time this just to get an idea of how quickly this takes, is emerge minus minus update. So that's the same. You can see the update is the second, uh, third option there. Changed use, again, that's, no, that's not there. So what this flag does is it looks for any uh, changes in use flags. Um, so it identifies packages that need to be updated, updated based on Either a use flag that's been enabled or disabled. Deep, uh, that's a flag there. It makes it search deep, I believe, that one. Um, the next one with B depths, I'm not sure offhand what this does now. Um, I think the B depths means binary depths, so yeah, I'm not quite sure. It might be if you've got, um, rather than installing some larger packages from source, you can install binary equivalents that have been pre-compiled. So it may be a switch to take that into account. Um, I don't normally have binary packages. In fact, I can't think of the last time I did have any system where one was installed. But the Raspberry Pi might be an example of that because it is quite slow and, and limited on amounts of memory to install some of the larger packages. Um, then I've got the world set, which is basically all the packages that are not part of the system, which is going to be any packages that you add in manually. So currently the world set is likely to be empty. It won't have any packages because we haven't added, added any. But the world takes into account the system as well by, by adding that in. If I specified system there, it would only deal with the um, default packages that come as part of the basic Gen 2 system. Minus AV, these are shortened versions of the um, ask and verbose. So the minus A is the equivalent of minus minus ask, and the V is the equivalent of the minus minus verbose. Ask, it asks me if I want to carry on, and verbose just gives me uh, a bit more useful information. Backtrack, I think the normal recommendation for this one is 30, but I usually set it to 1000, and it just gives it a bit more of a chance to resolve any dependency conflicts or situations that um, it might not have been able to resolve. Um, a thousand successive, um, but I have known it to actually resolve um, conflicts and things, um, although it will make the emerge run slower because it's got a lot more work to do. For both conflicts, we'll display um, conflicts with a lot more information so it'll help you track down any problems with packages that are conflicting either through version clashes or um, slot clashes um, anything that um, can't be installed because of some conflict with another package you'll get a lot more information on the screen so it's good to have jobs um, I generally set this one to 4 but because the Raspberry Pi is is a little bit limited. I'm going to knock that down to two 
Uh, bear in mind we've set the make jobs to four, so in theory if, we, if there are two jobs running it means there's possibly eight threads running. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind, especially if it's a bigger package you might want to knock that down to one. But generally with smaller packages I find it's not a problem. Keep going is a good one to have if you've got a huge update you want to leave running at night. If it encounters a package that fails it will basically effectively rerun this command and it will try and carry on without that package. Now if that package is a dependency required by later packages and obviously the emerge will just um, abort at that point because it needs that failed package to be installed. Um, but generally you can get a lot done um, if you do have a failure it will it will get most things completed so that's that's worth having as well. Now this one I discovered um, well, so a short while ago, maybe about a year or so ago, changed depths, and this I found helped me um, overcome a lot of problems I was having updating where I was getting conflicts and things. It does make um, more work, there's more updates that need to be done, and I think what it does is it, if there's any chance that a package has been affected by another package then it will rebuild it even if it's not a direct dependency it will rebuild it um, whereas I, th I believe without that option um, it will only rebuild packages that are directly uh, affected by a dependency and if for example like that jobs 2 I've got set at the moment to 2 if I want to override that I generally just tack on a minus J1 on the end um, which will quickly, it's quickly to, it's quick to add that on and uh, remove it without having to use the cursor keys to get in the middle of this. Um, you know, I can delete that if I wanted to, if I wanted to change it. But that's basically the update command that I use. So I'll run that now, and this will, yeah, the disk has gone to sleep again. So this will just grind through all the current packages. As I say, I'll probably identify. The, oh, I need to get rid of that news item now. I've done that. Um, it'll ident probably identify that IPv6 that I've disabled. And yeah, there's quite a, oh 60 packages, crikey! And that's on a, a default installation. So you can see it's bringing yeah these are updates. So it's bringing this auto conf archive probably because this maybe this XATTR package needs it which is being updated then net tools is being rebuilt probably because it relies on XATTR and so on M4 is being updated Z standards being updated and so on um, the rebuilds are because they've got dependencies on um, previous packages that have been updated so you can see approximately I'd say approximately 30 40 percent are updates and then the rest are rebuilds because of those updates um, you can see also that there's certain um, ch changes here which are in green and these are changes which are difference, differences due to the use flag settings that I've set. So SQLite is obviously um, an option that is used by default. It wasn't originally when the Gen 2 Stage 3 was built. You can see here my IPv6 has been disabled here so it's a change, which is why it's in green and also why it's got a star next to it. Um, bin disk, again, that's obviously one that's not required anymore, so that'll build OpenSSH from scratch. The yellow ones are system uh, imposed changes, so maybe at some point um, this magic option was available and um, the current um, package maintainer has deemed that this is not by default required the same with this Python 9. The ones in brackets are forced so Unicode is forced on so even if I try to disable Unicode uh, either globally or locally for this package the package maintainer has deemed that that's absolutely necessary so it's forced on no matter what I do likewise this one here audit or SE Linux uh, have been forced off so there's nothing I can do about that apart from probably rewriting the e-build which is the script that defines how 
the packages are built. So everything looks okay to me. Um, so what I shall do is start this building. Shall I start this build? Yes, because we, it's set up to take the world set. So I'll start it building and we can carry on. Oh yeah, it mentions the use variable here, funnily enough, after the updates have been done. Um, yeah, it says that you can also find descriptions in this file here. And yeah, it describes here how to actually add and remove flags, depending on what you need. Now, um, I tend to keep the flags in alphabetical order just to make it easier to find, or of course you could use a search, but I think it's nicer to uh, keep them in alphabetical order, it's just nicer to read. There's a bit there about the license variable and it explains it. Um, so there's nothing that's come up about that, otherwise we would have got a warning at the bottom here, so don't need to worry about that. At the moment, I think there might be something we install that where we would have to um, edit that. But yeah, it looks like we can skip all the way down this time zone. Um, so I'll start this update running now. And you'll see what it does. It does some checks, first of all, on certain packages, either for space or memory or uh, kernel um, requirements. Sometimes there's options in the kernel that are needed to be activated, so it checks for that. You can see it's found our um, optimizations here, but generally I found GDPC, I think GCC as well, maybe bin utils, uh, the Gen 2 system strips anything untoward. And you can see here that it's found, or it couldn't find the kernel environment so it doesn't know what to do with these options here and I think it will report this right at the end um, so we'll have to deal with that when we come to um, deal with the kernel so I'll let that run and while that's running I'll carry on, I'll be able to carry on with some of the configuration so what I have to do is become root again. I'll get the window up with the truth commands. I'm not sure they might actually be there. No, they're not. Uh, duplicate this actually. All oh, right, it's on this page. Yeah, so I just want to rerun these commands to get back into the truth. Okay. Now I can go back here and carry on with the configuration of the system. So th what we're going to do now is set the time zone for the machine so we know where we are. And you can see there's all the um, continents here and you can look inside there. So for example if I looked at Europe, I am. There's all the available time zones, and one for the UK is London. So that's what I do with this command here. If I copy and paste that, I just replace Europe Brussels with Europe London. Oops. Just paste that in, and that's that configured. Then I can emerge this configuration. and that's been updated now. System D is slightly different as you see there. Locales need to configure things like um, 
time layout, um, date layout, uh, monetary things, things like that. So that's what these locales are all about. So what I normally do here, you can see these are all remarked out. I normally uncomment these two, and for me, ENGB, all I need to do is just change these, put GB in there. Um, I think there is a wiki page on setting these if you need more information, but this is the general layout, and you, you do want to have a UTF-8 profile as well, because some, some packages do actually use that. Um, in fact, there's a warning there about it. I strongly suggest adding at least one. So once that's saved, we can the change we can save that. Uh, yes, and then we run this command locale gen to generate those locales. So it might take a while for jobs. Okay, that was quite quick. That's surprising, being as there's um, work going on in the background with this emerge. So that's all done. So next we need to select a, a locale to use as a default. So currently you can see there's this CUTF8. I want to use this one here. So all we do is e select locale, set, and the number next to the option that I want, which is 5. And it switches the language profile to that option. As it says there, you need to run source etc profile to update that and it's got rid of the truth by doing that uh, in fact they give here oh they give a better command here env update as well not sure what that does but let's put this in and oops because uh, it'll also update the uh, the trouble with highlighting things with the cursor, it picks it up into the keyboard. Yeah, this command also re-updates the prompt to display truth. So that's okay. If I rerun the eselect locale list, you'll see that the option that I chose has now got the blue star next to it, showing that that's the uh, profile that's now active. And there's a link there for a full localization guide if you need more information about that. So configuring the kernel is the next part. Now, as you can see here, they um, tell you how to run the emerge command to get hold of the actual Gen 2 sources. And as I said before, it's more or less like a, a vanilla version of the kernel with um, some uh, customizations for Gen 2 that won't work for us unfortunately we'll find a lot that won't work with the Raspberry Pi so the best thing is to use the um, Raspberry Pi Raspberry Pi kernel and we can get that from um, well for those who built their own kernel previously you've seen this but those who haven't um, what we need to do is to type in uh, RPI uh, kernel build something like that and generally again first link is the link we want and describes how to build a kernel here for the Raspberry Pi um, but this time instead of cross compiling if you cross compile the uh, kernels get the 64-bit version we don't do that we just build a straightforward uh, kernel, but we have to remember that we want to build a 64-bit version. So to get a copy of the Raspberry Pi kernel source, we open this link, open it in a new tab. That takes us to this page. If you click on this button here, fuel branches, and no, what have I done wrong there? Not branches. Uh, tags is what I want. And then view all tags. 
and you'll get like tags that tag every now and then, which I I'm um, take as being fairly stable. You click on that, oops, and that's the package there that you want to download, and you want to put that into user source, which is where the um, kernel normally lives. Now because um, those of us who have rebuilt the or built the cross compile kernel we've already got this file we don't need to download it again so the best thing to do is if we get a new terminal up terminal up sudo into root and we copy this which is here as you can see copy the that file into full slash sorry not that that's the directory it's the one called raspberry pi into the mnt gen2 user source and that's done so now if we go back to our true environment that file should now be there there it is and we can now extract this package and it'll be a lot faster than the first time we did cross compile because it's on the disk the hard disk and we can go back to the kernel the Raspberry Pi kernel page I'm just going to check to see that it is actually yeah it is about building yeah about building the kernel so um, there are some Gen 2 specific options here. Obviously, we're not going to have that. Um, so we'll have to ignore that. It may be worth checking these options here. So let's go into this directory. Um, one thing we should do, which would normally be done when we download the Gen 2 sources, is to create a link. Um, to this directory that we've just created so um, we can do ln minus sv s for symlink v to get the terminal to show us what we're actually done and it's the linux raspberry pi directory we want to rename it to linux and what we do now is if we do e select there's an option here for managing the user source Linux symlink. So if we do e select kernel list, it shows us the um, symlink that we've just created. So this has appeared because of the symlink we just created. So if you download another um, uh, Linux kernel, so um, an updated one, if you download it here and extract it, then when you did eselect kernel list, it would show that other directory and you can use this to activate the other directory. So what we need to do is to change into this directory. And we just want to check some of these options are active within this, um, this kernel. So to make menu uh, in fact, what I should do first is I'll go to the kernel building pages for Raspberry Pi. What we'll do first is we'll do these options here. And we want to tell this um, to be kernel 8 for the 64-bit kernel. That's the default name, um, just so that the kernel uh, build knows what to build. And we want to run this command here to create a default config. And those who built the cross compiled version of the um, kernel will note that we're not using any of the other variables where we had to specify what, where the cross compiler was and so on. It's now just a native build that we're running because we are running in a 64 bit kernel um, together with the 64 bit environment that's provided by the stage three. 
so that's written a config file out so we're now going to do make menu config to alter some of these um, options and we'll go back to here so a lot of these options shouldn't need changing I wouldn't have thought but it's worth checking right the display is too small I sometimes have this um, it's where I've made the font too big and we need 80 columns so it looks like the uh, terminals moved over actually so I'll just rerun that it's not a problem and the first thing we need to go to is device drivers which is down here generic driver options which is up there and maintain a dev temp fs is checked and auto mount dev, dev temp fs which is checked as well so that's okay SCSI disk support, well, it must be set because, um, sorry, back in device drivers, because we've previously, previously built this kernel with default options and I'm using a SATA drive on a USB port and that uses a SCSI sus subsystem. So, as you can see, yes, it is set. Uh, file systems, worth checking. We definitely want the VFAT. That, again, would be there. I'm sure because the Raspberry Pi uses it for the boot partition. But let's check that anyway. So under file systems. Yeah, we've got extended four. It suggests using extended two and three, but unless you know you're definitely going to use them, it's probably not worth adding in. Got some extra ones here which you may use. Um, let's look for the DOS ones. Make sure they're in. Uh, there it is there. So MS DOS FS support and VFAT. Yep, they're in. That's okay. Pseudo file systems. It wants proc file support. We've got that. And temp FS virtual file memory support. So that's okay. Now PPOE necessary drivers. Again, like I said, I don't use that, so I'm not going to bother checking that. Um, SMP support that should be there um, because again it's a default kernel um, sorry not that one processor type features where is that original setup It's gone to actually. All right, let's look for symmetric. Multi processing. Okay, looks like it's not an option on this kernel. Maybe if it's been disabled because it always needs to be set, something like that. Um, Yeah, there's things like this which have been um, or have appeared because we're on an arm. So it could be that this symmetric multiprocessing is not an option on, on the arm. It's only AMD. Uh, USB support. Again, I wouldn't have thought anything would need to be changed here. Um, as you can see, the, the disk is USB based. It's working. The keyboard and mouse I'm using is USB based and they're working fine from the keyboard it's giving me a bit of trouble every now and then but it should be uh, so I pass that HID yeah HID support generic HID driver battery level reporting USB HID support Transport layer that's there, yeah. USB support. Um, now it's got to set all the versions of USB, you might not need that. Uh, see, we haven't got the HCI support because the Raspberry Pi 400 hasn't got that, so I'm not going to enable that. 
Same as for OHCI, new HCI. There's no point in enabling that. It hasn't got that feature. And this is it was a good example of why the Raspberry Pi kernel is so good because it's been pre-configured. There's very little to, to, to change. Um, then we've got architecture specific kernel configuration. So there's nothing else to do here. Um, obviously, it's not a, an Intel or AMD based processor. There's no GPT. There's no UEFI, so we don't need to worry about that. There's one thing I will alter, which is under... Go back to the top, CPU, power management, frequency scaling. I'm going to set the default, rather than power save, which will default to 600 megahertz. I'm going to set that to on demand, so I don't have to set it up manually. Um, I'm not sure if it's also setting in the config.txt for this as well. So we can look at that. Um, but apart from that, I'm going to quit. Yes, to save those changes. And then if we go back to the kernel. For, oh, yes, that's one thing that's worth changing is the local version to help uh, discriminate between um, a default kernel. It will display a string to show that it's not a default kernel, that it's one that we've built ourselves. So where is this? It's in... Kernel, or is it general setup? Yeah, here it is. Here, so it's already got the V8 in there because it's a an ARM V8 processor, and we can add on, uh, for example, Gen 2 uh, and kernel text, for example. So it shows that it's a kernel that I built for Gen 2 working, and I've built it. So that will get appended to every um, version name uh, wherever it appears. So to build it, you can see they've got the make command here to build. So I'm going to time this. Um, it will take quite a while because we're building uh, emerging programs in the background, so it's going to take a lot longer than normal. Um, so I'll let this run oh, it's interesting no. oh yes that's interesting it was called image before I'm sure it was Let's see if there's a bit about compiling. That's the 64 bit. What's the configuration? Right, yes, it's just, oh yes, that's right, yes, it's just, it, the, this is what I mentioned before, there's no compressed version of the kernel for 64 bit, which is why I can't find that target. So it's got to be just image. And there it goes, it's firing off building the kernel. So I'll leave the kernel build on display while it builds because there'll be a lot more happening there than there will be on the uh, Gen 2 build. That's just going to be quite slow. Um, just putting a status display when it's emerging, starting the build and when it's actually installing the build. So I'll leave that. Oh, that's something we should have checked. Um, we'll do that afterwards. I have to remember that to add those namespaces in there. They might already be in, but I'll add them in afterwards. Um, and hopefully it won't be a complete rebuild again. Oh, what's happened there? That was quick. No, something's failed, unfortunately. Ah, right, BC's not found, so we need to add that in. So, right, that's a good good time to go back and add these namespaces in. And hopefully whatever is using them will pick it up. 
IPC underscore NS IPC underscore NS So let's go there. Oh right, they're already set. So it's just the fact that there's no sources for that package to see. So that's good. There's no changes to make there. So all I need to do is to merge BC minus AV because I want to keep it in the world set. If it was something that I didn't want to keep in the world set, then I'd have to use minus one AV. One meaning one shot, which means you just want to add it to the system but not keep it indefinitely. And it would only keep that package there um, while it's required by something else as a dependency. Um, when we tidied up the system, it would remove it. But so we obviously need to keep this here for the kernel. And come to think of it, when you do emerge the Gen 2 sources, BC does get pulled in at that point as a dependency. But because we haven't pulled that in, uh, we haven't emerged the Gen 2 sources. That's why BC is not, not here and why we need it. So this is quite a small package. It shouldn't take too long to build. Generally, it's not really a good idea to run more than one emerge, but this is only a small package. It's a single package without any other dependencies. So it shouldn't be a, really a problem. You, you could potentially get into issues about dependencies dependency problems if you did uh, run one more than one merge, emerge command and also there's the issue of memory and so on and how much load you're putting on the processor. Okay so now we've got BC it's installing it. And now if we recall the command to build the kernel, it should just carry on wherever it got to, which obviously wasn't very far. Yeah, that looks better. So yeah, I'll leave this screen up and I think it's a good hour and a half for this to build. And it's obviously going to be a bit longer with the um, jobs that are emerging on the other tab. So it's done a quarter of them already, but um, yeah, it's going to be probably a few hours.